ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this Voltimum and ECA webinar on Smart Cities Minefield or Gold Mine. Um, we're here today with Darren and Luke from the ECA. Um, they're going to guide you through this uh, brilliant presentation on Smart Cities. Uh, there's, a, there's not a CPD certificate supplied with this presentation, and also the PDF will be available off the slides at the end of the webinar. So without further ado, over to Darren and Luke. Hi, I'm Luke Osborne, the Energy and Emerging Technologies Solutions Advisor, a nice, short, catchy title for ECA, and I'm here with my colleague. Yeah, my name's Darren Smith, I'm the Digital Building Solution Advisor for ECA. So today we're going to be looking at um, the smart city through uh, an electrotechnical lens, which should bring some interesting questions and uh, hopefully some uh, potential business opportunities. This webinar aims to explore some of the concepts and the ideas around a smart city and looks to see if our current business models uh, can be expanded potentially or may indeed need, need to be reconsidered. Indeed. A lot has changed since the early days of electricity distribution, uh, displacing gas for the lighting of cities, uh, to it being the backbone of nearly all aspects of the domestic and commercial world. Um, there is now very little in the inhabited world around us that hasn't been influenced or enabled by an electrician, and it's about to get a whole lot smarter. Uh, what we're aiming to cover today are powering the smart city, domestic sector energy, electric vehicles and energy storage, domestic sector smart homes, followed by a Q&A at the end. Okay, so um, although the term smart cities is conceptual to some degree um, and it applies to many sectors, what would you suggest are the key drivers to help frame um, the, the term and uh, what may it mean to our sector in particular? There's a number of factors behind this. A large part of this has to be about improving and protecting the environment. Um, rapid advance of technological innovation and the swiftness of market adoption uh, leading to production at an economy of scale and general affordability has opened up the fast accelerating realm of smart devices, the smart home and the smart cities. Uh, this is equally being facilitated through the availability of big data, not just in storage but also in cheap processing capacity. Uh, smart devices are seen as time-saving devices and can give the perception of an improved quality of life. Okay, great. Well, we looked at um, the idea of uh, decarbonisation um, the, um, of the system and environmental ideas. What's driving the government and uh, legislative framework uh, in, in this space currently? Uh, global climate change acceptance, uh, efficiency legislation, and the market for low energy, low carbon products. Uh, the Climate Change Committee report uh, from February this year continue to highlight the critical need for action and the fact that housing in its current state and function needs to drastically improve. Uh, there is now also the requirement for large businesses to report energy use and their emissions intensity ratio through the streamlined energy and carbon reporting scheme. Although fears of rising fuel costs haven't yet come to fruition, there is a general awareness of fuel volatility and that, together with legislative changes in energy use and efficiency, is aiding the demand for these products. Feeding into that direction of, of energy is that at a national level we're facing, we're potentially facing an energy supply issue, struggling grid capacity caused by older power stations being decommissioned and replacements not being brought online in time, if at all. Uh, the move away from fossil fuels and towards a decarbonised energy supply has led to the rise of renewables and the micro generation of energy. Okay, interesting, yeah. So looking at the, the larger energy ideas of our smart cities, can we first discuss the, uh, the e increase in energy production considerations and what the aim ultimately would be to power the cities of the future? What are the, what are the power generation considerations? As mentioned, the decarbonisation of our environments is key going forward. The UK has made great strides in renewable energy generation over the past decade and is well positioned geographically to make use of wind power. Unfortunately, onshore wind turbines aren't able to compete in contracts for difference at this moment in time. And there's a core group of politicians repeatedly blocking onshore wind projects in the UK, contrary to the views of their constituents. At ECA, we're very supportive of renewables and would like to see an end to this moratorium of onshore wind as it's significantly more cost effective. 
It's estimated that one gigawatt of new onshore wind farms would be £30 million cheaper per year than offshore wind and £100 million less than that of nuclear and biomass plants. Maintenance and installation would be cheaper and there would also be an increase in job creation and massively aid the powering of our smart cities. For the time being, new wind turbine developments will mainly be confined to the realms of the offshore electrical sector. Although co-location of onshore wind together with solar PV and electrical en energy storage is hoped for in the not too distant future. Okay, so sticking with this theme of the larger energy ideas and the production of energy, uh, what is going on uh, in particular for renewable generation sectors? Well, solar PV is the largest employer in renewable energy globally, providing 3.4 million jobs. Um, although generation through solar in the UK was limited up until 2011, there has been a large push uh, since then through government support. And as of the end of uh, February this year, there was over 13 gigawatts of installed PV generation capacity in the UK. In addition to PV and wind, we also have sig a significant proportion of our generation through biomass and anaerobic digestion plants, as well as gas-fired power stations, of course, uh, which are becoming a lesser part of the electrical generation mix. Okay, good. So the generation of energy is only one aspect of this proposition for the provision of power. Can you um, introduce and address uh, the enablers that tie in and support the, this uh, generation proposition? It's through the maturity of and the economies of scale now afforded to electrical energy storage that is allowing renewable energy to become the ideal low carbon energy generator for our smart cities. The joined up communication of the data within these generation spaces, storage and demands will con contribute to the smart grid and the smart cities. Okay, great. Thanks for that, Luke. Uh, interesting insight to um, the macro ideas of the energy uh, and the work that the engineering communities are undertaking. It's also refreshing to understand that the uh, the high curve of these concepts has finally begin being infilled uh, by the engineering communities. So let's now focus a little bit closer on uh, the domestic sector application of this. Our current energy system is a, a bit of a top-down approach, let's say, uh, where in effect can we, we consume energy provided by the energy companies and the stakeholders. But what and how would the smart city look like uh, with this in mind? How, does, how are these things going to change? Like you say, traditionally energy was supplied to an end user from the grid connected to a centralised electricity generation. Uh, this, this is not the most efficient of methods due to transmission losses. Um, through changes in technology and availability, the end user can now produce their own energy, consume their own energy, store their own energy and export their own energy. This has led to the rise of the prosumer, the producer and consumer, a term that is featuring more and more in common usage and in the wiring regulations. An interesting term, yeah, yeah these, these are evolving. Yeah, this is a, a radical paradigm shift, really. I mean, what are the main types of um, microgeneration available for this new term of, of a prosumer? Again, uh, the most common are solar photovoltaics and wind turbines, but also heat pumps, biomass boilers and solar thermal. Uh, they've all had assistance in gaining ground in the UK through government subsidies, which has helped to grow the sector to a significant level. Uh, they're covered by MCS, the Micro Generation Certification Scheme, uh, which has provided a quality assurance framework for domestic installations and to help to ensure the safety standard of workmanship and consumer protection and that confidence is maintained. Okay, diving deeper into the individual technologies, what would you consider or what are the considerations for installers and the public now that the, the feed-in tariffs have changed? Well, the feed-in tariffs ended last month and there was an element of uncertainty as to whether installers would see any benefit in being MCS certified, but it is still the best way for the consumers to be sure of a safe and quality installation, in addition to it now becoming a condition of the eligibility for the export tariff successor, the smart export guarantee to be claimed whenever that comes into play. 
Um, an installer is also required to be MCS registered to install under the energy efficiency installation schemes, which prescribe to past 2030 and past 2035, uh, and most likely any future government schemes also. So we've talked about um, electricity generation, but what about the utilisation? There's been some noise about restricting gas connections for new builds, for instance, in the future. What, what's, what's the news there? The government is leaning towards the electri electrification of heat, and the Climate Change Committee UK Housing Fit for the Future report highlighted that in order to achieve the carbon reduction targets, no new gas connections should be made to properties beyond 2025. Um, although this had previously been cited by government as happening from 2017, there is, it, it's clear there is now the push and direction driving this, which obviously ECA support. As the energy mix of our electricity networks becomes greener, so will heating. Uh, the integration of electrical heating becomes easy to load shift and also concentrates engineering resources into this area. Great, Luke. Keeping on this theme, then, talk to us about the opportunities of renewables in heat generation. The smart city needs to drive renewable energy to its core. 85% of UK homes use natural gas, uh, which is far from clean. It's cleaner than oil, but it's certainly not a clean heat resource, hence the real need for change. In addition to electric panel heaters, storage heaters and electric underfloor heating, the electrification of heat includes heat pumps. These could be air sourced, ground sourced and water sourced, uh, all of which essentially work in the same fashion as a fridge, but in reverse and uh, have been gaining ground in the UK. They have really impressive efficiencies and can lead to an out output ratios in excess of four to one. Uh, so therefore, for every uh, kilowatt of electricity you put in, you get in excess of four kilowatts of heat out. Currently, these are still supported by subsidies through the RHI, the Renewable Heating Incentive, which helps to offset the installation costs for the end user and increases market adoption. Early installations had carried a, a lot of bad press through misunderstanding of the application of these technologies, uh, the low delta T, the need for correctly calculating heat loss, etc. Uh, but now the UK has greater understanding of this. Um, they're cost effective for new builds, but can be expensive for retrofitting to existing housing stock. Um, and we're, we're ECA working with manufacturers to increase the information flow uh, for our members in this area. Given that the uh, heat generation is the number one contributor to CO2 emissions, what other forms of renewable heat generation may be significant to the domestic home prosumer? Alternative heating systems include biomass boilers and solar thermal. Uh, they're both good, proven, low-carbon energy solutions. And both, both require a level of electrical install, uh, involvement and both have their merits. Solar thermal works very well as a complementary system to the other systems mentioned. Um, it's clear that as technologies develop, that they are tending to span more than one area of specialism. Where electrical devices were previously solely within the realm of the electrician, there are now many crossovers to other disciplines. Electricians can be involved at many levels with these systems. They could solely be contracted in to carry out the wiring up of the electrical components, the heat pump, sensors, control gear, etc. Or well, they could control the project from start to finish, enabling additional customer offerings and additional revenue streams. Good. So we can we can see how new technology is enabling the low carbon and, and heating solutions. Um, and we can identify business opportunities for electricians. But how does this interplay a little bit more closer with, with smart cities? Can you can you elaborate? We've got these great generation and heating options, uh, but energy efficiency should be the first port of call for all domestic and commercial property owners and occupiers. And this area really links in with the smart buildings and smart cities concept. Uh, reducing demand is normally the easiest and cheapest option in comparison to generation and existing energy delivery methods. And smart tech is helping to facilitate this. For example, you have the lighting and occupancy sensors, device management, smart thermostats, and also replacing energy intensive devices with smarter, efficient devices. 
Okay, so taking a look at how the standards uh, standardization communities are, are dealing with this, uh, in particular for our industry, what are the JPL 64 committee's reflections around uh, around these ideas? And um, let's look at BS 7671 in this case. Okay, the 18th edition of the wiring regs includes uh, Appendix 17, which includes recommendations for energy efficiency measures. Um, Whilst DCA recognise and promote the need for energy efficiency, we feel this would have been better placed within the building regulations, um, approved document part L, which firstly, it's enforceable, and secondly, places these requirements with architects and building designers. It's often too late for these considerations to be put into place by the installer without considerable changes to the original design. Architects and building designers will consult the building regulations, but are unlikely to consult the wiring regs. Um, that aside, uh, these are some of the recommendations in Appendix 17. Um, it's mainly for commercial installations, and as I said, the emphasis is on the designer and the installer. And the des designer needs to take into account the load energy profile, the availability of local generation, uh, reduction of energy losses in the electrical system, and uh, earmarking devices that are acceptable for load shedding. That last point is important for the smart grid, um, as the DNO can then remotely turn heavy usage devices on or off for balancing the grid during times of peak demand. It's important to correctly identify what devices and circuits can and can't be shedded. A large fridge or heater can be load shedded, for example, without any discernible loss of function over a particular period of time. However, the same wouldn't be true for a computer suite or a server. Okay, so a part of this mix um, to look at the, the carbonisation of transport sector, uh, it's paramount. Uh, so we can now move on to explore the areas of EVs and uh, electrical energy stories, storage uh, in relation to EVs in particular. So the transport sector, as we said, is going through a, a true revolution. EVs form an intrinsic part of the transport ideas in smart cities. In the domestic arena, what and how are EVs playing um, their part and their role in this? EVs are still clearly in the early adopter phase. Uh, the use of electric vehicles and electrical energy storage, uh, batteries, is set to exponentially increase. Uh, and 2018 saw an impressive 22% growth on the previous year uh, for EVs. Um, the automotive industry has been slow to bring electric vehicles to the masses, but now most have at least one in their offering, and this is uh, massively improving. But the barriers are being addressed. There, there's a greater choice of electric vehicles uh, now on the market, and pricing has become competitive against traditional cars, as well as subsidies being available for new EVs and charge point installations, which are available for both the domestic and commercial user. With each iteration of vehicle release, the ranges are also increasing, along with the number of EV charge points becoming available, thereby reducing the range anxiety. As I said, there will be exponential growth in EVs, and therefore the demand for charge points in both the domestic and the commercial space. So in light of your comments, uh, what role does uh, electrical energy storage play within this uh, EV and, and smart city concept? There's a number of static battery solutions now on the market. The majority are AC coupled to the building and involve a dedicated circuit to the distribution board with current clamps monitoring the flow of energy to and from the building should a generator such as a PV exist. Alternative solutions are DC coupled with the generator being connected via the generator's inverter. This results in less conversion losses in the system as the DC generated is directly fed into the DC battery and only converted to AC by the inverter once the energy is required by the building or deemed for export. Uh, through the use of batteries, uh, the locally generated energy can be successfully and efficiently used at source. Even in the absence of a micro-generation system, static batteries can prove of economic worth to the client by enabling time of use tariffs to be used. These work in a similar way to Economy 7, uh, and vary the cost of electricity to the end user according to peak supply times. The energy provider encourages the end user through pricing to import their electricity when there is a grid surplus and not during times of high demand. And through smart metering and controls, 
the end user can even sell back to the grid during peak demand times for a better rate than they paid. Um, we're starting to see software, uh, third-party software-based ag aggregation companies uh, beginning to enter this space. Um, aggregation and smart control required are also driving V to G, uh, vehicle to grid, which I'll come on to in a moment. Great. Earlier you touched on intermittent energy generation and it really is an issue of abortion. Um, what is the response to this issue and how do we overcome it from an engineering perspective? Yeah, one of the issues commonly cited with regard to renewable technologies, in particular solar PV, is that often the energy is generated, especially for a domestic situation, during times of minimal energy use. Uh, the chart here shows an average day with both the consumption pattern of a domestic property against that of solar energy production. Um, electrical energy storage and the potential of vehicle to grid connections also provide solutions to, to these problems. Peak consumption times are in the morning and evening before people leave and after they return to the property. The big dip in the middle coincides with the highest amount of generation from the solar panels. Historically, this would then be exported back to the grid with a small export payment being made to the generator. It's not the most efficient use of energy, as I said before. Um, with feed-in tariffs now removed for new installations uh, and the unknown price of export payments for future installs, there's going to be more impetus and focus on the storage of generated energy. Good. So collectively, and based on what you've said, looking into a solutions-based approach, what's technically in the pipeline? What are the solutions for these companies in particular? Uh, vehicle to grid, B2G, it's an area experiencing a large amount of scrutiny, investment and investigation. It's the bi-directional connection of the electric vehicle and the grid, with the vehicle being able to store and offload en energy to and from the grid as required. It's more possible through the adoption of electric vehicles, the premises will have electrical energy storage accessible in the form of electric vehicles, then through the separate purchase of a static battery. Um, it's hoped that by correct implementation of V2G, this could prevent costly grid infrastructure upgrades being required to supply the demand needed. A number of studies are underway, including one by OVO and partners. Battery technology is likely to be a game changer and, and could lead to significant economic benefits for all involved in the supply, installation and usage. The two areas of electric vehicles and batteries are going to require significant skills and resources from the electrical sector and it will be important for installers to be part of this. By getting the right information now through training and resources, they can put themselves ahead of the game and become the trusted installer. It is after all just an electrical installation. Excellent, Luke. That uh, offers a good insight into the macro and the micro energy ideas, into power and smart cities, and also the technologies that are and nascent and, uh, and are coming into effect. It's safe to say that these are rapidly advancing in all areas, um, and further changes should be expected. Definitely. Um, so we've looked at examples of where the energy side of things is going, um, but I think. Most of the viewers will want to hear about the down and dirty technological bones of smart cities. And it's true, once you start to connect up the technologies we've covered with emerging smart tech, things start to get interesting. Um, what can you, Darren, tell us about the utilisation of these technologies? Uh, let's look at the domestic sector in the first instance and talk about the smart home. Uh, for example, how does the market define the smart home? Well, uh, the term smart home has uh, recently taken hold. Uh, previous to that, some classifications used the term um, home automation uh, was one of the given terms. So technical advancements are playing their part in forming these definitions within the sector. However, we can look at two dominant ideas in the categorization of the smart home, the first being the integrated smart home. The integrated smart home can be defined as a single occupancy or multi unit dwelling equipped with a central control unit or units and gateways connected to the internet and then numerous devices can be connected together via this service. Uh, These connected devices come from at least two market segments and are generally in the form of uh, heating and cooling which uh, as you've mentioned forms the largest energy consumption. Um, solar, v, uh, solar PV and storage as you've also mentioned, the entertainment sector, um, streaming services are, are an example of this. 
um, blinds and shades control, which can assist in environmental control, and then lighting control, which is an early example of some of the early comforts and um, smart home uh, controls we had. The fire and security systems, which are life critical services in some cases, and then as you've just recently mentioned, the electrical vehicles, they're charging or indeed dis they're discharging. These are all segments of the smart home. And then secondly, we can look at uh, the other definition, which is a standalone system. And this is defined as an isolated application of control that does not necessarily use a central control unit, but often has a single hub or gateway. Uh, it serves as a single purpose only, and it can be directly controlled via a router gateway through an app in some cases. So these are the early signs of what we're, um, what we're seeing and the definitions involved. Okay, so what's the appetite for smart homes and devices in the UK? So yeah, the big four of the all released reports in 2018 in order to offer insights into the state of the market and potentially some of the predictions into its future. In a recent PwC report, some of the key insights included that um, almost 40% of people entered in the smart home market via smart entertainment devices. This is a relatively recent trend and differs from the first wave of a more top-down approach to the smart home being fully integrated. And while 40% of these device owners expect to upgrade within two years, data privacy remains a barrier for the 20% of people who don't own smart devices. Governments have recently reacted promptly to these perceived threats as cybersecurity becomes of great importance domestically and around the globe at scale. So when it comes down to smart homes technologically in the UK, the indifference of things has fallen from 72% three years ago to 52% in 2018. People are forming an increasing affinity to tech and its mixed virtues, so the story continues to unfold. Well, it sounds like the population is rapidly becoming more receptive uh, to smart homes and uh, the smart tech that's uh, involved. Um, what are the leading appliances being purchased or installed? So according to a YouGov report, The Dawn of the Connected Home, penetration of appliances and technologies varies. The report explores the public's perception of smart devices and the degree of success that the brands have had in encouraging take-up of the various devices and their applications. So as we can see in this diagram, currently uh, standalone systems are, the, are a main staple in the UK. This relates to the market definition we've just been talking about. Here we can see the market penetration of smart devices per se. Speakers dominate in the home in this context and digital assistants prevail. Thermostats stand at 6%. The UK's 27 million households will need to rapidly adopt a new low carbon heat solution through the 2020s and 2030s, especially if we're going to meet our carbon budgets. Um, the heat in the buildings accounts for nearly a fifth of the UK's CO2 emissions. So looking at lightning and security systems of 5%, uh, they follow as the most popular devices in, the, in this report. Um, and then looking below, we can see that smart domestic appliances, these are all increasing and becoming more readily available. And these create the chance not only to replenish the fridge, so to speak, but they act as data pools to, to contribute to a, to a bit not an atoms approach to our energy usage. Ideas can fall out of this, uh, like local energy planning. Um, this can potentially emerge and this could be a key tool to enable the UK's transition to a low carbon future. Local governments could help identify the most promising and cost effective options for this decarbonisation. Um, they can also highlight effectiveness of where the investment is needed. There's a strong case to equip local authorities with these capabilities to help shape this energy use. These plans can further inform network investments um, and help deliver what was already um, considered to be an ambitious decarbonisation goal. So with all these drivers there, um, I imagine a lot of our viewers will be wondering what, what sort of revenues are being generated in, in the UK smart home market. Okay, so according to Statista, a strong American statistical portal, revenues in the smart home market is suggested to amount to 3,014 million in 2019. In accountancy terms, the revenue is the income that the business 
um, gains from normal business activities, including the sales of goods and services to customers. Revenue is uh, you know, also considered to be uh, sales or turnover. It also predicts that revenue is expected to show an annual growth rate of 16.6% between 2019 and 2023, resulting fundamentally in a market volume of 5,580 million by 2023. And the reverse, um, that this revenue could be um, could be the benefits of electricians. Household penetration is currently at 24.9% in 2019, and it's expected to hit it, you know, a staggering 43.5% by 2023, not, not too long. So these are promising figures that we could suggest that, you know, a growing consumer appetite for the sector. Um, as far as it seems, electricians are the most uh, currently best suited people to take opportunity. It's incredible, um, especially that, uh, yeah, uh, this year alone it's going to reach over three billion pound market. Um, so it's clear that although this is a nascent industry, there's already an extensive market emerging. Um, moving more into the detail of the smart home, would it be good to get an idea of the ecosystems involved? Yeah, certainly. Yeah. The term ecosystem refers uh, to the collective technologies from the subsystems which make up the whole system. This is part of this new lexicon that's forming. So yeah, we can take a look at the uh, a, a little closer and try to, to bring this into context. So most people would unwittingly have already opened their homes to the smart homes concept through the installation of smart meters. Uh, how do they fit into the grand scheme of things? So firstly, just to mention, um, thank you to our friends at Beamer for, for these diagrams. Um, so according to a recent Bayes report, households and small businesses have made the choice to adopt smart meters with over 12.8 million in the UK currently operating in smart mode. But the rollout has been fought with setbacks and, uh, on many different levels. However, in May last year, the Smart Meters Act 2018 received royal assent. And this extends the government's right to exercise its powers over the rollout until November 2023. These dynamics play a role in smart meter and smart home rollout. And engagement in these processes will help move to expedite this opportunity. ECA are embedded in, the, in this kind of work. Taking a look at this Model 1 with, with, with a smart meter, a uh, consumer access device, and an in-home display. This, these are connected to a small-scale energy generation solar panels in this instance, and potential loads fed from sockets outlets in this case. So this helps form uh, a basic form. It, it can offer a powerful type of data and the smart meter rollout will aid in understanding of energy uses in order to, to control it. Okay, so once the smart meters are in, how can they or will they work? What, what sort of black magic do they hold? Well, there's a, there is no black magic. Um, these technologies are proven. Um, they simply need the political will and other market forces to align. So let, you know, let's keep it simple here. Look, and, you know, we, uh, these devices generate data. I am on, I am off, I am in a variable state. This data is pushed into a cloud service, or generally, and then compute power works on this data, eventually offering insights into to the customers and the supply chains to improve efficiencies, safety, comfort, etc. This is already happening on many levels. Um, our smartphones are uh, and a good example of the of, of a ubiquitous technology. Taking a look at this diagram in particular, we're looking at some of the segments that a more advanced smart home can offer or will offer. The circles on this diagram indicate demand side response you alluded to earlier, which is the scheme where customers are financially incentivized to lower or shift their electricity use at peak times. This will help fundamentally the load and voltage profiles on the electricity use network. Again, there are already working models of this, so there are no dark arts in this in this situation. Okay, uh, can you explain to us how the various elements are networked together? Yeah, so if, if, if data in this situation is king, then the king um, the king needs a kingdom, and network can be considered uh, the network can be considered as this kingdom. In the past, some have viewed uh, traditionally that the network is the power network. However, this perception is changing. And rightly so. The electrical network system has long recognised uh, 
um, within the utility, uh, the definition. And after all, um, data is only uh, and, and, you know, simply represented by voltage. Um, the network can be broadly split into two areas, the smart home area network and the consumer home network. The smart home hand network is cellular and proprietary and uh, there's government, current government consultation as to where and who the data owns. Um, the ECA are involved in this at the minute. And then the, the second is the consumer, the home area network, the CHAN. And this is where traditionally we can see um, the, uh, the smart home installer being involved. Okay. Uh, what examples can you give which we typically see in the domestic situation? Uh, you just alluded to the, the consumer hand, the C hand. Yeah, so here we can see what would be you know, constituted as the consumer hand home area network. And this is where electricians are mainly focused from a business perspective. All subsystems within this space uh, form part of the network. These subsystems can be programmed in a variety of ways, some proprietary to the manufacturer. Systems integrators use their skills to provide interoperability and manufacturers have numerous solutions available. KNX is a, an open source example of this solution, the solutions available in this space. As an example, how these, uh, these subsystems can work together, um, looking at the function of this integrated system, um, if we can look at the idea that, let's say, a smoke is detected, in this case, a, a fire, then the services could be called, all doors and windows could be unlocked, the entertainment system and alarm, um, could alarm the occupants, the blinds and shades open, and lights could flash to alert the services in the dark. Um, so the, uh, the, the heat and the solar systems uh, are made safe and the car could be started perhaps. These systems can be tailored to the individual needs uh, of the customer, depending on budgets, of, of course. Wow, it's quite exciting stuff. Um, apart from the network side of this, what is facilitating this sci-fi scenario uh, to actually be with us and working now in 2019? Okay. Emerging, the emerging Internet of Things devices will increasingly contribute to form. Some estimates suggest that 75.44 billion devices will be connected by 2025. All devices with something to offer or take in effect will be attached to the network and its data is harvested or consumed. In turn, this data will be collected into the cloud or services on the cloud or edge which is compute power located in the home to avoid latency. And then artificial intelligence, or to be more clinical, machine learning, will analyze this data, spot patterns, predict, and learn to personalize our experience in the home. A useless interface is a new term that's appeared. An example of this is where the, know, the home knows you've listened to a comedy podcast at 8.30 on any given Saturday night, and therefore suggests something and um, the following Saturday night will remind you to say learn Spanish or to take medicine, you get the picture. But the digital assistant is the bridge to this scenario and although it's still primitive um, here and now, it does show signs of, uh, of great potential. Well, that's, a, that's a whole lot of uh, devices connected and a whole level of assistance that we're going to get going forward. Um, moving on, there's a, there's a lot of hype over power over Ethernet. Uh, and how this is going to aid the installation and the powering of smart devices. Uh, what can you tell us about the latest developments in this area? Okay, well, we, we move back into the realms traditionally attributed to the electricians, a tradition that I, I can add that's changing, um, to look at the advancements of power over Ethernet. As we can see in the diagram, we've got uh, on the right hand side, we've got a type 1, um, which conforms to the IEEE standard 802.3 AF. Um, and it can supply a maximum of 15.4 uh, watts. This was created back in 2002, and it supplies energy to low power devices on a, on a network, VOIP phones, sensors, and wireless access points, for instance. Moving on, Type 2, commonly referred to as PoE Plus, can supply a maximum power to a port of 30 watts. It's backwards compatible. And it can be, you know, and handle more power demands and loads. Moving on again, type three, known as four pair PoE or PoE plus um, plus. It also uses this uses four pairs in a copper cable and conforms to the 802.3 BT standard. 
it can supply more power and this power is around uh, around 60 watts and then finally and interestingly in september last year uh, the 18th um the type 4 uh, which is only available over cat 6 uh, cable um it's commonly referred to as higher poe um type 4 conforms to the newest um bt standard um, it can supply a maximum power to a port of 100 watts in order to accommodate this growing power requirement of the network devices or IoT devices. It can even support power only laptops or TVs. It, it, it's also backwards compatible. This is a game changer in a domestic situation if we think about it. We've got 90 watts, let's say, um, 10 gigabits per second over 90 meters. This is a big deal in, in how we uh, are we going to wire and power the home. Um, the only loads that may require traditional wiring systems to an earth or small SWA are motor and heating loads or submains of the garage, for example. And this fundamentally changes current domestic wiring methodology. If we can provide DC power without inversion and conversion, as you mentioned earlier, losses are kept to a minimum. BS7671 is currently considered an extra low voltage installation in part seven, and ECA are involved in this work too. Yeah, indeed, uh, a lot's changing out there. Um, through power over Ethernet, it sounds like we have a real solution for hardwired devices and their and their power requirements. Um, now, most of us have heard about three, uh, 5G even, and the promise of large data delivery over this new platform. How does 5G feature with smart cities? Well, it's safe to say that this technology sits firmly in the near future for the UK, uh, and it constitutes a considerable infrastructure project. But that said, there is an international race for deployment and uh, you know, the, the, the race is on. In, in a city environment, 5G is set to be much faster than previous generation networks. Some are saying as much as 100 times faster than the existing 4G. Uh, to get more specific, 5G offers speeds as fast as 10 gigabits per second. This would mean the ability to download a full HD movie in less than 10 seconds on a 5G network compared to 10 minutes on 4G. Some of the estimates see 5G being even faster than that. Um, 5G also has much lower latency. We'll see much less delay or lag when using our devices or phones. With 4G networks, latency can typically be around 40 to 50 milliseconds. And with 5G, that should be around about one millisecond or even less, which is practically undetectable to the user. It will also provide greater capacity, meaning the networks will be able to cope better with many high demand applications all at once from connected cars and IoT devices to virtual reality experiences and simulations of, uh, of HD or simultaneous downloads HD or 8K, 8K video streaming. Pushed into the home and into devices, 5G can offer backup to services in, on the wide network. After all, when we uh, start using critical services uh, in our smart homes, then fail-safe mechanisms need to be employed. Uh, that's an incredible uh, uplift of data speeds, and uh, you, you can really see how this is going to facilitate things going forward. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be lots of new tech is going to enter this space, as well as uh, new applications and solutions to things we didn't even know were, were problems at this moment in time. Um, we've heard a lot about how smart cities and smart and the smart home can work, um, but now let's look at the potential opportunities that are going to be available for domestic installers going forwards. Well. This could be a gold mine. Um, it already has been for many, but we can just look at how many homes still need treatment, as it were. Um, the simple fact of the matter is uh, is that this is a is an opportunity. Let's take a look at a, a little bit closer about what these uh, what these opportunities may be. Okay, Darren. So, uh, yeah, tell tell us what these opportunities are. So, government is committed to delivering. 300,000 homes a year by the mid 2020s and on the 1st of October in 2018 it announced further plans to speed up the planning system as well as make it better use of land and vacant buildings to provide homes that these communi you know, communities need. Should these homes be smart and enable residents to be safer, more comfortable and energy efficient? Well in, in AECA we, we think so. so Home England is a government, uh, government's housing accelerator and it's aiming to drive positive market change and is an extensive, it's an executive non-department public body 
sponsored by the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. Home builders are being encouraged to visit the site for further information to access the provision and funding mechanisms here. So are there any technical innovations and movements that are helping to facilitate this home building programme? Yeah, so we could probably bring in here building information model on or BIM. Um, I think this will assist in delivering these cities and the homes within it. So BIM is an intelligent 3D model based process that gives architecture, engineering, construction professionals the insight and tools to more efficiently plan, design and construct and post manage buildings once they are built. It. Um, the Centre for Digital Build Britain is in partnership between um, Bayes and uh, the University of Cambridge and it aims to understand how construction and infrastructure sectors could use a digital approach to better design and build and operate, etc. Um, they're doing some great work as custodians of this project. The UK BIM Alliance additionally um, uh, represents and works with and for the built in industry and it facilitates the drive to digitally transform industry through education, leadership and focus. In an industry of over 4 million people, where 95% work in SMEs or micro SMEs, this mission is to ensure that everyone understands the value of a digitally enabled industry. Recently, uh, there's been an addition to the standards of BSEN ISO 19650. It's the new international standard related to BIM Level 2. Um, BIM Level 3 is being considered uh, academically at least, but focus remains on the Level 2 rollouts at this point. Okay, so yeah, fast changing, uh, fast changing industry. I don't know. There's lots of uh, supportive mechanisms being put into place. Um, there's also many advantages to the smart home model. Uh, are there any particular sectors that are really seeing virtue to these advances? Well, the stronger, strongest case for the smart home, arguably, is when using um, the home to assist living. The UK population is projected to continue to grow reaching over 74 million by 2039 and the population in the UK is getting older with 18% age 65 and over, 2.4% age 85 and over uh, and as a result of the ageing population the old age dependency ratio, the OADR is increasing. The OADR is the number of people over 65 years of age for every 1,000 people aged between 16 and 64 years old. In mid-2016, the UK's OADR was 285. Additionally, there are also 13.9 million disabled people in the UK. 8% of these are children, 19% of working age adults, and 40%, 45% of, 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 of a pension age. Um, so, with, you know, these are some interesting statistics. Um, so, looking at how the, how the smart team can, be, can help, um, as a use case and assisted living, we can see some of the some of the ideas on the slide. If if homes can be built to assist people of all abilities, then not only does the quality of life improve, but it could benefit our the overburden of healthcare system and enable us to use government coffers more wisely. Um, the term smart home will you know eventually die one day. It will simply be a home again, um, but it will be a home that assists in our safety and well-being. So looking at this use case, we've got care alerts, which uh, can alert the family, friends or neighbours. We have appliance tracking, for instance, where uh, if a kettle comes on at a certain time in the morning. We have audible reminders to, to take medication, for instance. Visual reminders, which could flash uh, the lights uh, there's visitors. A panic button for you know, incidents arising. And then sensors, and this sensors uh, is a growing trend. Um, it replaces our sensory perception in the home. Okay, so as well as smart homes and smart cities being important and uh, yeah, getting credence by the tech savvy uh, and uh, looking to address energy saving um, options, um, yeah, it seems to be addressing a, a whole whole world of uh, sectors um, and providing many solutions and advantages to many different sectors of society. Um, with any emerging area, it's important to have a degree of framework and guidance. Uh, are there any standards and or codes of practice available for installers working in this area? And are there any concerns for the public that may need addressing? Yes, Luke, yeah, the, the, 
these standards are quickly maturing and the committees are working hard in the background to refine these standards. Uh, there seems to be a convergence of uh, information technology, telecommunications and electro technical standards at play. We can, we can take a look at these a bit closer. Um, through uh, the use of the stakeholders, the IET and BSI are making advancements in these areas. The JPL committees are working on DC power over IT cables, POE, in effect, what we've just spoken about, um, for potential inclusion in Amendment 1 of the 18th edition Ryan regulations. Other BSEN standards have recently been updated, as we can see here, BSEN 50173 for information technology and cabling as a part for, for the home, for instance. And as I say, the, the standards continue to work and, and offer stability in the sector. In the sector. On a related note, uh, two, two codes of practice have just been released uh, for public comment, so it may be worth uh, visiting the IOT site. So it's the code of practice for building infrastructure for healthcare. Uh, and then the second one is the IET guide to cables and cable management. They both can be found on the on the IET website. Okay, so as well as those codes of uh, practice that you've uh, just mentioned, um, can you tell us about any, any specific codes of practice in the smart cities, smart homes place? Yeah, so there are several codes of practice um, um, recently published, uh, all related to smart homes. The, uh, the code of practice for connected systems, integration of buildings. There's a past document um, sponsored by uh, CDIA. Um, its development was facilitated by BSI and published under license from BSI. It came into effect in 2017. The code of practice for cyber security in the built environment, again, we uh, an area we have to manage. Uh, and then uh, the CO, COP for low and extra low voltage DC power distribution of buildings. Um, the guide, interestingly, the guide uh, for smart homes for the electric installers is due out um, in a DPC format soon too. ECA uh, have contributed to all but one of these documents and these publications, uh, and these can actively help to indicate the, the formative nature within the sector and offer its st stability. Okay, there's a, there's a lot of advice out there which is uh, reassuring. Uh, one thing that you hear mentioned a lot, especially with regard to people allowing smart devices, etc., to operate in their homes and businesses, is the notion of cyber security and the threats and virtual backdoors that people are often open to. Uh, what's your word to the cautious out there? So, so cyber security is and, and will remain an ongoing issue, uh, cat and mouse, uh, uh, to some degree, as it were. But the National Cyber Security Centre is aiming to make the UK one of the safest places in the world to live and do business online. It was set up to protect our critical service from cyber attacks, manage major incidents and improve the underlying security of the UK internet, internet through technological improvements and, and advice to sit citizens and organisations. Its Secure by Design report aims to address cyber security issues and the responsibilities onto the, on and into the design phase of products. Uh, increased connectivity via IoT um, provides fantastic opportunities for the UK and these issues can you know, potentially stall adoption. Um, Furthermore, um, to combat this uh, and on a more granular level, the CPNI, or Centre for the Protection of National Infrastructure, focuses on the security of the physical asset, these IoT devices, and the cyber security of the networks that, that manage the data around these devices and, uh, and control systems. Additionally, BSI have also, uh, also have a kite mark for IoT devices, all of which are signal a robust management method to protect against cyber security issues. Okay, it's clear that this is a well thought out sector of industry and there, there appears to be good framework regarding standards and codes of conduct. Um, apart from installers keen on adding smart home offerings to their business model, just sitting and reading through the standards and code of conduct, what other options are there for education and training? So yeah, it's, it's imperative that the uh, correct education and skills are provided to support this um, and people undertaking uh, this new work. Um, the national educational frameworks are just to provide uh, STEM type education uh, at secondary level. Um, T levels uh, are the technical equivalent of A levels and these will offer students in the classroom learning and on the job 
train and experience Jordan, um, you know, Jordan industry placement. Uh, this has to be at least 45, 45 days. So this is definitely a, this part, a major part of the movement. Okay, that's, that's reassuring. Yeah. Can, you, can you elaborate on that at all? Uh, these are obviously new skills uh, to our sector. Well, so what, what's the current state of play? So the Institute for Apprenticeships is in process of creating a smart home technician apprenticeship. It's waiting for the endpoint assessment, the assessment plan uh, to be finalised. The electrotechnical apprenticeship trailblazer is currently under review and consideration of how the smart home technician skills and the knowledge um, that it, it forms and how it will be uh, brought into the fold is yet to be decided. There have been changes to the current ECS framework uh, these changes to, to labourer, manager and related discipline cards have been introduced so that the ECS uh, can contribute and continue to meet uh, the construction skills certification scheme partnership criteria. For, this follows an announcement uh, by the Construction Leadership, Skill, Leadership Skills Council that nationally recognised qualifications should be in place for all construction related occupants uh, occupations by 2020. Qualifications will be required to gain a card, which again signals a movement to ensure a robust delivery. Okay, so there you have it, a somewhat roller coaster overview of the growing concept of smart cities and smart homes, uh, what's involved and how they're likely to be powered. Um, we hope that our listeners and viewers have enjoyed and indeed found useful the information Darren himself tried to put over. Uh, and unless you have anything else to, to add, Darren, uh, we'd like to ask if there's any questions from the audience, which I think Chris is uh, going to... We have had a couple, yes. Um, I'll just go and make sure everyone can see them. So, um, Colin Arla has asked, um, LED lighting uses most of its power and suffers most of its life loss through the driver. POE could power driverless LEDs at ELV, DC, um, which would be a vast safety improvement and slash energy usage. However, these devices appear to be some way off, but surely this is the way forward. Yeah, that, uh, yeah that's a correct assumption there. We can, uh, if we can admit the idea of a driver, obviously the, the, you know, the associated um, problems, anything we can take out of the system as per usual is always beneficial yeah, generally. So. Yeah, that's. Uh, but again, we have to wait until the manufacturers uh, are addressing these issues. Uh, we can we can see that there's a lead lag in some instances. Yeah, but the, uh, the the idea of a um, DC microgrid in in properties is an idea that that's being looked at at the moment and and would definitely address uh, many of these uh, efficiency losses due to conversion. And um, we've had another question in and um, from George. Yeah who says congratulations on a very useful webinar, so thank you. Thank you very much. Um, sure, yeah. uh, have we um, got, any, got any data or estimates on breakdown of installers' activities and investments in the UK traditional versus smart home technologies? I think this is information we're trying to drill down on at the moment, um, because it would be interesting to see how, uh, how companies are shifting into that area and, and what kind of percentage this is actually making. Uh, so hopefully this is something we can find out. Yeah, we're, we're going to be engaging on membership uh, broadly in these uh, the, in these areas and, and trying to mine our data, uh, enable to us to be able to be more responsive and, and, and also provide this data out to the wider community. Um, we're constantly scanning the uh, the sector and the and, and the the landscape to be able to bring this data into the fold and and, and get it out in a in a synthesised manner to to the wider electrotechnical community. Okay, um, Georgia, we will be in further contact once we have the data then. So. Yeah, we, we, we'll, we'll, be into, we'll get the email address here and we'll, uh, we, we are working hard over here to try to get this data and we'll, we'll try to get out as soon as possible. Great, okay. Um, so does anyone have any further questions? We'll just give it a few seconds, we'll see if there's anything else that comes in. Thank you, David. Certainly. Somebody's typing. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, so we've got another line from Carl. So Carl says, interesting webinar. Can you explain how heat source pumps are four and a half times efficient um, for kilowatt input? output but gas is five times cheaper per kilowatt. No, because we're talking about efficiencies not costs so this is all about carbon savings. Yeah we, we, we need to be thinking um, I think on a grander scale we you know we're here we, we are we'll look to try to decarbonize the uh, the energy um, uh, the energy supply so uh, some of these figures uh, may not be wholly supportive and sometimes while the market uh, dynamics change um, we'll see anomalies like this and, and we'll, uh, we'll shift around these uh, as, as these dynamics do change. Exactly so yeah it's, it's, it's about it's not about economic efficiency uh, it's, it's the whole carbon savings but if you kind of look at those comparative kind of figures one's five times cheaper one is four and a half five times more efficient then you've kind of got a, a, a kind of break even point to, to work on. I know the, the initial uh, installation of heat pumps at the moment is more expensive, but supply and demand, economies of scale, uh, with this bit becoming the, the new form of heat going forward, uh, yeah, you'll, you'll uh, reach a point of price parity. Okay, great. We've got a call for this, thanks. No worries, Carl. <laughs> Um, I've made the PDF of the slides available for everyone to download on the screen, so you should be able to see these. If you have any problems downloading them, please email us at inquiries at voltimum.com and we'll make sure you get a copy. And we'll just give it a little while longer just to see if there's any more questions. Okay, I think we'll, um, we'll we'll call it quits there. Excellent. And if anyone has a question about this webinar um, that they haven't managed to ask now, they can ask us at, um, via email at inquiries at voltman com, and I will pass them on to Darren and Luke and get an answer for you. We'll endeavour to do our best. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for today, guys. No worries. Uh, yeah, that, thanks for everyone for listening in and your kind comments afterwards as well. Uh, we hope it was uh, enjoyable and informative. And thanks for me too.